So this was another question that I posed and uh, that led into a dis discussion about the affordances or features of uh, tools that allow um, or enable certain kinds of actions. So, so for example, a tool that allows you to see someone else that has high fidelity affords um, a different kind of interaction than a tool that's text-based. And I, I want to use an example to help you kind of understand this. I've got a bunch of door openers here, doorknobs, okay? All of these doorknobs have different affordances. So I, let's just start with this one. What's an affordance of this doorknob? What's a feature or a characteristic of it that, that allows it to do something? Yeah? Okay, you could open it with your foot if you had to, right? Or your elbow, right? You could lean up against it if you're carrying some groceries. That's an affordance of this kind of uh, doorknob. Good. How about this one or this one? What are some affordances of those doorknobs? Yeah. Yes. So one of the affordances of this is that it actually prevents or makes difficult certain kind of actions, right? Your young child is not have the wrist action to be able to open a door like this. Or this one even has a little lock on it, right? Which is even trickier to get open. Was there another hand up here? Okay. How about these ones right here? Yes. So you wake up, everything's dark, you know, you can see where the door handle is, so you can make it to the door. Good. How about this one right here? We see these in, we've got these at the back of this building, this room. What are the affordances here? Dave. It tells you whether to pull or push. Okay. By looking at it, it's obvious that you don't pull on this doorknob, right? Great. If you're carrying a lot of things, you can open it. Great, yeah. In fact, this, this door was created for a very specific purpose. And that is for fires in the case of an emergency. Because what happened historically was uh, you have a big room with lots of people in it. Somebody calls fire, or there really is a fire. People run for the door. And guess what happens? First person smashes up against the door, can't turn the knob or whatever. Everybody else piles up behind them, and uh, the door doesn't open and people die. So this one's created so that if someone falls up against it, notice these, this knob is always on the inside of the room, the door will open. Okay. Let's look at the very last one. This, I really like this one, too, because this has a different kind of affordance. Any ideas here? Okay. Looks, you know, it looks like a hand. Some people might think it's welcoming. Others might think it's kind of creepy. <laughs> Yeah, Th this, the affordance on this one, I mean, there are a lot of affordances, but the, the primary one that we see is one of aesthetics, right? This door is telling you something about the owner of that house, right? I mean, they would choose a doorknob like this for a reason. It, it communicates something. It communicates an aesthetic. Um, and with our online environments, the tools that we create also have this kind of affordance. They're not all functional affordances. Many of them are affordances that are aesthetic affordances that draw people in or make people feel comfortable interacting or, or make it easy for people to interact with them. So I want you to think about the affordances of some of the digital tools that we have available to us today and the things that they enable or disable that um, we can use in our educational environments. So one affordance that Dave has talked about 
in his previous talk is this idea of openness. If a tool is free or freely available online, that is an affordance that enables access and enables other kinds of interactions to occur. To occur. Some of these tools enable high fidelity interactions because they use video. Some of the tools afford synchronous interaction. Some don't afford synchronous interaction, only asynchronous interaction. So the tools that we select are very important and they, they bring power and um, possibilities to the learning environment that we are trying to create. What are some of the affordances of a live instructor? Chatting about with my neighbor here, um, at least in my live classroom in the public school, you know, I'm able to interact with my students, and they can give an input as well. I mean, they can they can add to the discussion, and, and the interaction is lost uh, through through a digital or. Okay, sir. Certainly, if you compare a face-to-face -face classroom with a classroom that is predominantly learner content interaction, you don't have that same kind of interaction, right? Thank you for that. Other things, what other things do, does a live instructor afford? Right here. Okay. So a live instructor can make uh, quick problem solving decisions on the fly about how directions to go. That's good. Let's take one more. I, th I thought I saw one other hand here. Okay, go ahead. Okay, so the empathy aspect, and I can, I can have empathy for someone who maybe has some other struggles in their life and show love for that person or caring for that person. You're absolutely right. A machine doesn't do that. Okay? So, so um, effective designs take advantage of both of these, the strengths of the technology, but also the strengths of human interaction. And you should be able to identify the value added of the technology and the value added of the human component for uh, effective designs. Um, I'm going to pose this because of time as a uh, rhetorical question, but are there some things done better in face-to-face -face than online and vice versa? And here's an example of, if you look at just a method of doing um, classroom discussion. Here's some examples of things that work very well in a computer-mediated environment. The flexibility you can have everybody participate. You can have a, a greater depth of reflection, whereas um, in a face-to-face -face environment, uh, the strengths are the human connection, the spontaneity. So these are complementary things that can happen if we if we include both of those. Dave. And I expect you're going to do this, but under a computer-mediated environment, you parenthetically said that it's asynchronous and that it's text-based, which maybe some years ago was what computer-mediated environment meant, but I think you've already said in the right. presentation that that's not what it Right. It's mo it's mo we, we have to think beyond that now, because we can add the fidelity and we can add the synchronicity relatively cheaply. Now, so one of the things that I think is the most important, this is in my personal view, one of the most important aspects of uh, or affordances that a human brings to the table, a human instructor brings to the table, is this idea of learning to become something. Um, we can learn to know things, we can learn to do things, we can learn to become things. The becoming has to do with our dispositions, our attitudes, uh, our character development. And 
machines don't do as good of a job or as efficient a job at this as humans do. If you think about this, um, teachers motivate you to want to learn a topic in addition to teaching you the nuts and bolts of the topic. So I learned this uh, very clearly my first couple of years of teaching here because at BYU because I found as I were, was teaching teachers how to use technology I found that I could th the way I structured my class I could almost guarantee that all of the students in my class came out with a certain level of knowledge about technology but what I also found was that um, if I wasn't careful my students could come out knowing how to do something with technology, but they hated it. And so as soon as they were out of my class, they would never do it again. That's the becoming. And if, if teachers motivate students to want to learn a topic, some of the other aspects become less relevant because the student will put more energy into the learning process.